Today is May 12, 2022. And based on certain things I have, I have observed, I have to wonder, where's God's hand on America? Is God covering America? Or is God giving America a spanking? And you can apply what I'm about to say to your country also. Where's God's hand on your country? And a part of this, I have noticed that there are certain individuals. It's almost like everything they touch, it goes the wrong way. If they say something bad is going to happen, good things happen. If they say good things are going to happen, bad things happen. And personally, there are times I don't see God's blessings. Now, there are times when I see His justice, I see His judgment. It is important to discern the hand of God. And the part is, is God for you or against you? In the book of Job, in Job 1 verses 6 through 11, it reads, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down it, mm. While I'm reading this, another scripture has come to mind that I didn't write before. So let me retrieve it here real quick. Because I see how this plays into this message. Hmm. Oh my gosh. Hmm. Another one is coming up. Oh boy. Hmm. This is not good. And at the same time, it's good because certain things it helps to know. And you get another scripture here. And according to the scriptures, Deuteronomy 19.15, By two or three witnesses, let every matter be established. And of course, to some people, this may be a witness with you regarding what you have been discerning, or maybe what the Lord has told you. Hmm. A lot of times, people want to prophesy about blessings, blessings, but there can be blessings, blessings, when people are doing evil and they're not repenting. And there's something that God is against, and that is a shedding of innocent blood. And even in Genesis 4, when Cain killed Abel, his innocent blood was calling out to the Lord. In Revelation 6, it speaks about those who are in heaven calling out to the Lord for justice for their blood that was shed on the earth. Does America have some blood on its hands that's crying out to the Lord from even the ground? David was a man of the Lord's own heart. But when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and her, had her husband killed, eventually the Lord brought judgment down upon him. The wage of sin is death, and the Lord could have killed David. But the Lord had mercy upon him, in part because he knew he would repent. And he sent Nathan the prophet to rebuke the king. 
and to also impose judgment upon him. And the judgment was firm. But Nathan said, The Lord had put away his sins, but he still dealt with them. So America or any other country, no matter how God-fearing they may profess to be, and even more so when a country is supposed to be God-fearing and does wickedness, eventually those things will come back. The sins will come to roost, if you will. In a lot of ways, the Lord judges those whom he loves harsher. James 3 speaks about few should be masters or teachers because we'll be subject to stricter condemnation. Matthew 23, the Lord Jesus Christ rebuked the Pharisees and scribes, and he spoke about them receiving greater condemnation. In Luke 12, verses 47 through 48, the Lord spoke about those to whom much is given, much is required. America is a nation that has received much. Therefore, much is required. America as a nation has sent out many missionaries to different areas of the world. And now it's like missionaries need to come to America to evangelize. Wasn't expecting all of that. So again, the sons of God appear before the Lord and Satan. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. So in this case, the Lord is going to allow the devil to test Job. But in Job's case, Job was perfect and upright man. Is America's a nation perfect or upright? If you're in another nation, is that nation perfect or upright? For some people, they get tested. For others, it's true relation. The difference? Testing, the Lord is allowing Job to get tested. Tribulation is when those are suffering the consequences for their actions. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Do the leaders of your countries Fear the Lord. Are they professing that they serve the Lord when their actions are more akin to that of the devil? Do you think the Lord is going to allow those things to go unnoticed? The Lord also raises up kings and he pulls them down. And sometimes he allows things to happen. The book of Judges, it is a cycle. The Israelites strayed away from the Lord. He raised up someone to afflict them. They cried out to the Lord, turned back to him. The Lord would get rid of that, um, that oppressor. The people of Israel would stray from the Lord. And the cycle would continue. Because they wouldn't walk in righteousness. Choices have consequences. Has America or your country lost the fear of the Lord. And one of the litmus test that a country's leadership has lost the fear of the Lord is that they'll even use the Lord's name to justify wickedness, things the Lord is clearly against. They will say they serve the Lord, but their very actions deny him. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Has not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in a land. But put forth now thine hand, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. It's from a wicked one himself. It tells us about the hand of God. It speaks about a hedge of protection around him. But now saying, put your hand against him. The hand of God can protect. The hand of God can also discipline. And sometimes the discipline of the Lord 
is to simply raise his hand, his hedge of protection, to give the devil a greater inroad into a country. In 1 Samuel 8, the people of Israel wanted a king to be like, to rule over them like other nations, even though they had the God, even though they had God Almighty Himself ruling over them. The Lord gave them what they want. Some nations have been crying out for Satan to rule over them. And the Lord may give them a taste of that to see how they truly like it. While I was reading a while ago, one of the first scriptures that came to mind when I speak about nations doing wickedness, eventually judgment comes. Those sins come to roost. The Lord is making a covenant with Abram, later renamed Abraham, in Genesis 15. And in verses 13 through 16, these are worthy to note. And he, meaning God, said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be stronger in a land that is not theirs, and he shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. By the way, there are many biblical examples where the Lord handed people over into captivity so that they learned to fear Him. They learned to love Him. They would not go whoring after other gods. God does not change. And also, that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge. The Lord also has a history of that. He will hand a nation, if you will, over to an oppressor as a part of their judgment, and then he'll judge the ones that he used to discipline, to correct, in a sense, his children. I've said this before, it's important that leaders have godly men and women to advise them, to include, let them know, this thing that you're thinking about doing, if you do it, you're going to bring God's judgment upon this country. Joseph was a governor in Egypt. He advised the Pharaoh. Whether the Pharaoh listened or not, that would be on the Pharaoh. But it's almost like the Pharaoh gave the Joseph the keys to the kingdom. Daniel was an advisor to several kings who didn't know God. But because of Daniel, they at least listened. But in Daniel 4, King Nebuchadnezzar received a warning from the Lord. Daniel told him about his pride and about keeping in check. If not, things would come upon him. The king didn't listen. He learned the hard way. It's important for leaders of nations, especially those who say they're God-fearing nations, to have godly men and women who stand up to those leaders. Micaiah in 1 Kings 22, he told King Ahab the truth. The same thing with Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. John the Baptist he told King Herod the truth. It wasn't lawful for him to have Herodias, his, his brother Philip's wife. It cost John his life, but at least he spoke the truth. So back to Genesis 15, 13 through 16. So the Lord is saying the children of Israel would be in captivity for 400 years, but he would judge the Egyptians. Well, wow. now I see a segue to a scripture they have coming up. And afterward, shall they come out with great substance? That's part of the Lord's mercy, even in judgment. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. The iniquity of the Amorites. So all their sinful ways, all their hard-heartedness, the Amorites, the Lord is keeping track of that stuff. And eventually it's going to get to a point where it's going to, go, where it's going to come back upon them. America and every nation in this world, what have you been doing? What kind of iniquity has been building up for the Lord to pour out upon you? Or to at least remove his hand? The Israelites would be in captivity for 400 years. There are times when the Lord, He waits for hundreds of years to bring justice. 
So something that's going on now, maybe because of something that wasn't atoned for, the nation didn't repent for hundreds of years ago, but the Lord remembers. So we see here about the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So it's like they're sinning. And sometimes people are sinning and they're getting away with it and they think they keep on getting away with it. Another example. This second one that came to me while I was reading from Job 1 in Revelation 18 verses 1 through 9. After And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. What are the iniquities in your country? What are the things that have been building up? Keep on getting worse. People are celebrating sin. Hmm. <sighs> Another scripture just came to mind because this will give people a clue regarding how they can get on the wrong side of the true living God. In Proverbs 6, Star verse 16, it is written, These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Abomination. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. I mentioned this before. The shedding of innocent blood. And heart that divided wicked imaginations, feet that be swift, in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. There are six things that God hates. Seven are an abomination. One of them includes the shedding of innocent blood. In nations where the taking of innocent lives, especially unborn children, does get more innocent than that. Where the taking, the shedding of innocent blood is not simply tolerated, but even celebrated. Nations have slid into a greater level of debauchery. When you start celebrating the murder of innocent children, that is iniquity in action. When you start celebrating it, when you start boasting about how many abortions you've had and you show no more remorse, that is iniquity of work, at work. That is what invites God's judgment. When a heart is so hardened that the loss of a life no longer matters, it is not simply tolerated, it is celebrated. Six things God hates, seven are an abomination, one of which is a shedding of innocent blood. Continuing Revelation 18, verses 1 through 9. So another voice saying, Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works. Things come back. In the cup, which she had filled, filled to her double, the cup of iniquity. 
how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her, and the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. God is not mocked. So the devil spoke by the hand of God, protecting Job, blessing him. And he wanted God to move his hand, not for Job, but against him. So again, where is the hand of God upon your nation? Is it for you or against you? Is it protecting or disciplining? The Lord can protect and discipline at the same time. But it's like there are many winds that may pass through a nation, but some winds are called prevailing winds. They're the most common. So is the Lord's hand for your nation or against it? So in Genesis 15, the Lord spoke about the children of Abraham, or Abram, being in Egypt for 400 years. At the time for their release, the Lord sent Moses down to Egypt to tell the Pharaoh of Egypt to let the Lord's children go. The Pharaoh hardened his heart. Even after Aaron had thrown down his rod and turned into a serpent, the magicians were able to replicate the same thing. They threw down their staff and turned into a serpent. But something happened that set the tone already. Where Aaron's rod had turned to a serpent, eight the magician's rods had turned into serpents. But Pharaoh still hardened his heart. Then the Lord started having Moses call down different plagues. After the plague of frogs, I'll read in Exodus 8. Verses 8 through 19. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. It seems genuine, huh? And Moses said to Pharaoh, Glory over me. What shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people? to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses, that they may remain in the river only. And he said, Tomorrow. And he said, Be it according to thy word, that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. Sometimes people seem to forget who God is, and then he reminds them. And the frogs shall depart from thee, and from thy houses, and from thy servants, and from thy people. They shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the field. And they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. I'm not sure if you've ever smelled dead frogs before. Of course, nothing dead is pleasant. <sighs> so Pharaoh, his sorcerers, his occultists, could not call off the plagues. Clearly, the Lord God whom Moses and Aaron were serving was mightier. To the point where he had to beg Moses to appeal to the Lord to call off the frogs. So these plagues was let him know. When you see a bunch of stuff going wrong, and it's like everything is going wrong, the question should be asked, where's God's hand in this? Are these things from the Lord? Because when the Lord is resisting 
a person, a group, or up to a nation, or even this entire world. There's no greater resistance than that. And it must be discerned. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. So God a break and hardened his heart. And there are times when people say about if we who are called by his name, if we humble ourselves and call out to the Lord about him having mercy upon us. And the Lord's done that many times. But there comes a point where if people don't learn the hard way, they're not going to learn at all. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod, and smite the land of the dust, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. So they didn't learn from one plague. They didn't learn from the blood in the river, the frogs, and now the lice. The Lord's going to keep on hitting them. So again, and the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod, and smite the land of the dust, or the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod, and smote the dust of the earth, and it became a lice in man and in beast, and all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. That was a lot of lice. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So they were lice upon man and upon beast. With the serpents, the magicians were able to replicate it. The blood, they were able to replicate it. The frogs, they were able to replicate it. But they couldn't call any of those things off. But the lice, they could not. Defiance will only work for so long. It will only go so far. So initially, the magicians, they're trying to fight against God. But then get this. Then the magicians said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. The magicians recognized the finger of God. So they knew the hand of God was against them. As a nation, where is the hand of God? Upon your nation. The magicians realized the hand of God was against them. But the Pharaoh hardened his heart. And by the way, the Pharaoh started hardening his heart. And then after that, the Lord started hardening the Pharaoh's heart. Kept on bringing judgment upon judgment upon Pharaoh. Judging the nation and even their gods. But they continued. And recognizing the hand or finger of God upon the nation. Also use an example from Daniel. In Daniel 5 verses 1 through 6 and 18 through 31. It is important to recognize the hand of God upon a nation. Is the hand of God upon a nation for blessings? Or is he disciplining a nation? Or worse, is his hand truly against a nation? Because he knows how to wipe a nation off the map. There are many kingdoms and dynasties that no longer exist. In Daniel 5, Belshazzar, the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine hmm, before the thousand. Hmm. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. They then brought the golden vessels 
that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines drank in them. They're messing with God's stuff. In scripture, says so as Jeremiah 27, the Lord had a prophet prophesy that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the Lord's servant, was going to come and bring judgment upon Judah, Israel, and even other nations, and that they should even submit to the king. Many Israelites, Judeans, were taken captivity into Babylon to include Daniel. But the Lord's going to allow it to continue for 70 years. So for many years, the hand of the Lord was upon Judah, but then he lifted his hands and allowed Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to take him into captivity. No nation's immune to such kind of discipline. Especially when they go after other gods. So now Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's son, drinking from the things that were in the temple of God. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold. Yahweh is a jealous God. His name is jealous. So when people are into idolatry, that's one way to either remove, for him to remove his hands from a nation that he was protecting, or to come against a nation that he wasn't protecting. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against the other. Whose hand was it that appeared from nowhere and wrote on the plaster of the wall? Whose hand was it? And was the hand bringing favor or judgment? The king consulted with his magicians, sorcerers, soothsayers, etc., his wise men. They couldn't figure it out. By the way, this is why some nations cannot figure out what's going on there, because they're relying on ungodly counsel. Daniel, he stated, O thou king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom, and majesty, and glory, and honor. But Nebuchadnezzar was a God-fearing man. But even Nebuchadnezzar, God was allowing him to conquer the nations that he did. Even though he wasn't a God-fearing man, the Lord used him as an instrument, to include an instrument of judgment against the children of disobedience. And for majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages, trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he slew. And whom he would, he kept alive. And whom he set up, or whom he would, he set up. And whom he would, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like beast, and his dwelling was made with the wild asses. They fed him like, with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over it 
also, or that he appointed over it, whomso, whomsoever he will. Whether your country is ruled by a monarch or someone you vote for, God is still in charge. Even if the person isn't professing Yahweh as God, Yahweh is still in charge. Daniel continued, And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart. And by the way, Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful king during his time, the Lord personally humbled him, having been living like a beast for several seasons, until he acknowledged that Yahweh, the God of Daniel, was the Most High God. And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. So even though Belshazzar was not worshipping God, he lifted up his hands or his heart against God, and the Lord's going to deal with him. He's called God Almighty for a reason. But has lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives and thy concubines, have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified? Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing or writing was written. So the hand was from God. Was it going to be in the king's favor? Or Babylon's favor? Or not? And this is a writing that was written. Mene, Mene, Tekel, Upharsin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Persia, modern day Iran. So even though this king didn't serve the Lord, the Lord's going to remove the kingdom from him. He want to know what the writing on the wall meant? Daniel let him know. The hand from God was against him. Judgment had been proclaimed on him. There was writing on the wall, but he didn't know what it meant. What is a writing on the wall of your nation? And what does it mean? Is God for you or against you as a nation? What are the leaders of your nations? What have they been doing? Have they in a sense been staying the hand of God regarding any kind of judgment? Or have they been inviting it? Even in the history of Israel, Kings such as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, led the ten northern tribes, Israel, into idolatry, brought down the Lord's judgment. Another king such as Manasseh brought down the Lord's judgment because of the things they did in leading the country. The leaders of your nation, it matters. They help to dictate whether the hand of God is going to be for the nation or against the nation. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, and put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him, that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. 
So 62 years old. Hmm. Darius the Medium took the kingdom. The Lord hasn't changed. He's still God. And a part of this thing about the hand of God, where is it? What's the hand of God doing for a nation or against it? These things are important to know. David, when he became king over Hebron, it is written in 1 Chronicles 12, verse 32. And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. The heads of them were two hundred, and all their brethren were at their commandment. So here we see the sons of Issachar, they had understanding of the times, and knew what Israel should do. Understanding the times, sometimes having prophetic foresight, being able to see it coming before it comes. But then there's also insight regarding seeing what is, what it is there. Daniel, after hearing about the king's dream, was able to give him foresight, foresight in Daniel 4 about keeping his pride in check or else the Lord is going to judge him. That was foresight. It came to pass. But in Daniel 5, what he gave was insight regarding where the nation was at the time, regarding where the hand of God was, whether it was for or against. Belshazzar died that night after the Lord brought down judgment upon that nation, and especially the king. So the thing about his son or children of Issachar, they were advisors to David. And David was a man of God. It's important for nations of leaders to have godly advisors, those who serve Yahweh, the Most High God. And they can recognize where his hand is at that time, or even better, when it's coming down. And not just simply those who are prophesying peace and safety, and the next thing you know, sudden destruction comes. In Exodus 32, we also see another importance of leaders having godly men and or women around them. Intercession is a very important for exa example of or function of a prophet's ministry, for example. And intercession is not just limited to prophets. In Acts 12, King Herod had killed James, John's brother, and had arrested Peter and was going to kill him. And Rhoda and the other intercessors were praying for Peter, and the Lord sent an angel to release him. Intercession is very important. Intercession is also how some people gain revelation. And if people are not interceding, praying to the right God. Sometimes a nation goes the wrong direction. But also part of intercession is that leaders will listen to the intercessors. Because there's power in intercession. And we see that regarding the nation of Israel. When they went astray, soon after the Lord had delivered them from the hands of the Egyptian, after the ten plagues, after parting the Red Sea. And I see a theme in this message regarding idolatry. The Israelites had not seen Moses in 40 days. He was with the Lord on Mount Sinai. And they decided to build a golden calf, something to worship, something to put in place of the Most High God. And when the Lord saw what they are doing, he was displeased. But thanks to Moses. Here's what happened. So in Exodus 32 verses 7 through 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, 
Get thee down for thy people, which thou bringest or broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. So for some people, they start off right, but right now they're on the wrong path. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed their unto, uh oh, sacrificing other gods. Hmm. And said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. So it's like those who refuse to repent of their sins. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I'll give and I'll make of thee a great nation. So in Genesis 15, the Lord promised Abram, later renamed Abraham, that his children would be in captivity for 400 years, then he was going to bring them out as a part of his fulfillment of the promise he made to Abram in Genesis 15 or Genesis 12. He was going to make them a great nation. But now the Lord is going to destroy them, or at least most of them. And he is going to, in a sense, start from scratch by using Moses and going to use him to raise up sons of Abraham, sons of Israel. What a great opportunity that was for Moses. And Moses besought the Lord his God. And said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people? Initially, the Lord was saying they were Moses' people, but now Moses is putting it back on the Lord. Which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Wherefore, should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath, and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest, by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I'll multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever." By the way, if the Lord had killed all the Israelites, save for Moses and maybe a few others, and just raised up a nation of Israel out of Moses, it would have still been a fulfillment of his promise to Abraham. It would have still fulfilled the promise. But what Moses did, he stood in the gap. He interceded for a sinful nation. Did it work? And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto this people. How many people have been like a Moses, where your nation has been involved in wicked stuff, and they've been interceding like Moses, and the Lord repented of the evil that he thought against them? For this story, Moses went down with Joshua and he went into the Israelite camp and he saw what they were doing. He ended up breaking the tablets with the Ten Commandments and some other things. But then he went to the camp and asked, who is on the Lord's side? The Levites said they were on the Lord's side. They strapped on their swords and they were commanded to basically cleanse the camp and then killing 3,000 Israelites. So even after intercession, there was still a consequence. But Moses interceded for them, and the Lord spared them. How many people in your nation's, in your nation's history, some people didn't even live in your nation, who prayed and asked the Lord to give your nation another chance? And the Lord, as he did with Israel, repented of the evil that he thought to do against them. And how can a good God think evil? 
the lake of fire and brimstone that is prophesied in, in the book of Revelation. That is evil. But it's an evil to deal with evil. So how many people have been like a Moses that prayed for nations, that caused the Lord to repent of the evil that he thought, and with people, the nations, when they got a reprieve, or reprieve, kept on hardening their hearts like Pharaoh, kept on resisting God, kept on going back to their wickedness, until that time came where there was no more opportunity for repentance. And if that sounds strange to you, let me introduce you to the prophet Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 27, the Lord spoke that if they are prophets, let them now make intercession to the Lord of hosts. And he said some specific things. But speaking about prophets making intercession, but it's not only prophets who can or do intercede. So Moses interceded in Exodus 32. The Lord repented of what he was going to do, the judgment he was going to bring. Jeremiah also interceded at times. But in Jeremiah 7, verses 16 through 20, it is written, The Lord said, Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry or prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. So this time, the Lord said in prophet, don't even pray. Your prayers will not help. Why? The time for judgment comes. In 1 Peter 4, it is also written that judgment begins in the house of God. Also speaks about it is better to suffer as a Christian as an, than as an evildoer. God is not mocked. So here the Lord is telling prophet, don't bother praying, don't bother crying out. Let's see why. Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? Their children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. So we see idolatry. And to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, saith the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, mine anger and my fury are, shall be poured out upon this place. Second like iniquities go down, and then they come back, or go up, and then they come down in form of judgment. So again, behold, my anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place, upon man, and upon beast, and upon the fee or upon the trees of the field, and upon the fruit of the ground, and it shall burn, and shall not be quenched. But if you think that's the only time the Lord ever told someone, don't even bother praying, don't bother interceding, because judgment has come. Well, in Jeremiah 14, verses 11 through 16, it is written, Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and an oblation, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword and by famine and by pestilence. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, Behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine. But I will give you assured peace in this place. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lie in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination, and a thing of naught, and the deceit of their heart. Therefore, thus said the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I send them not. Yet they say, Sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall these, those prophets be consumed. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword. 
and they shall have none to bear them, them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness upon them. Again, the iniquities go up, the Lord's wrath or his judgment comes down. Hmm. Also, heard from Jeremiah 7, then 14. But between that is also Jeremiah 11, verses 11 through 15. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I'll bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I'll not hearken unto them. Then shall the cities of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry unto the gods unto whom they offer incense. But they shall not save them at all in the time of their trouble. For according to the number of thy cities, where thy gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, have ye set up altars, mm, so that shameful thing, even altars that burn incense unto Baal. Therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up a cry or prayer for them. And by the way, you think about prayers or altars? Altars that were raised up in 2020. It may seem controversial, but maybe now, if you didn't know before, you're seeing the light. Were altars to BLM, the Black Lives Matter organization. When they're painting street corners, intersections, talking about say so and so's names. And sometimes the people who they were championing were actually caught in criminal acts. Raising up altars to all kinds of things. God loves righteousness and he loves justice. So if anyone was not given justice, the Lord loves justice. For I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. What hath my beloved to do in mine house, seeing she hath wrought lewdness with many? And the holy flesh is passed from thee. When thou doest evil, then thou rejoicest. So Jeremiah 7, 11 to 14. Three examples. The Lord told the prophet, don't bother praying. Don't bother making a decision. People engaged in idolatry. Now, something we can learn regarding if the hand of God is for or against us is from the story of Balaam. And by the way, what I read from Jeremiah 7, 11, 14, or Jeremiah 7, 14, 11, in the order I read it, Judgment came upon on Judah. It came to the point where people resorted to cannibalism because there was a famine. The Lord made a way of escape for Jeremiah where he didn't suffer like them, but he suffered some things. He wasn't taken into captivity. He wasn't taken to Babylon. So even in punishment, the Lord can still offer protection. When the Lord tells certain people not to pray, judgment has come. But Balaam, the Bible lists him as a prophet, but in Joshua 13, it refers to him as a soothsayer. Also, when he's introduced in the Bible, it speaks about him charging a fee for divination. That's one of the things that was mentioned. Those who are divining, those who are having visions of their own heart, the deceit of their heart. But interestingly, Balak saw the Israelites coming through Moab, or Moab, and he called for Balaam to curse the Israelites. He sent a contingent of men 
to Balaam. And even though Balaam also engaged in divination, the first thing he said was going to ask the Lord. The Lord told him not to go. Those men went back to their king, Balak. Balak insisted. He sent more men. And then Balaam went back to the Lord again. And the Lord ended up telling him to go. But the thing is, the Lord already told the prophet, no, the soothsayer. And he should have just left it alone. But scripture says, such as Revelation 2, lets us know that Balaam, even though he listened to the Lord, he actually provided a way for Balak to cause a stumbling block between the children of Israel and the Lord. Still led them into sin. So Balaam's heart was not right. Even though, even though he said he was listening to the Lord. But we can learn some things regarding Balaam's second trip. Or when he went after the second time. The second contingent. Also another thing. For leaders of nations who have professing Christians around them, men and women of God. They need to be people who are serving the true and living God and Him only. Balaam's heart still was not right with the Lord. So in Numbers 22, verses 22 through 34, this is something to help discern when God's hand is against us. Because if and or when God's hand is against us, this is one of those things where absolutely nothing goes right. Everything is like a person touches, it turns to dung. Everything turns to dung. And some people cannot perceive it. They keep on trying this way or that way, but it's not working. Their way is not working because Yahweh is against them. So in Numbers 22, verses 22 through 34. And, God, and God's anger was kindled because he went. What does inspired to say about 1 Samuel 8, where the people wanted a king to rule over them? The Lord gave them what they want, but it still resulted in harsh times against them. And there are times when the Lord will give people what they wanted to show that it's not what they needed. So when God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. So when the Lord told him, go, the angel of the Lord is going to resist him. Now he was riding upon, an ass, upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. Mentioned about the sons of Issachar, them seeing the sign, them seeing the sign of the signs of the time. This donkey was seeing the sign of the time that Balaam was not seeing. The angel of the Lord isn't there to save his life or protect him. The angel of the Lord is there to kill him. The donkey turned away and says, but Balaam smote the ass. He was hitting the donkey. How many people have been getting warnings from the Lord, but they've been Hitting, killing the messengers. And sometimes by killing, let's deplatform this person so we can't hear what this individual is saying. Have you noticed in some countries, leaders are talking about, oh, economists are saying this is not going to happen. And then months later, the same thing happens. Or everyone is saying, or all the advisors are saying this. It's like, haven't you realized that those who are advising you 
everything they're telling you is, is being spoiled? Could it be like 1 Kings 22? When Ahab, because he wanted to hear what he wanted to hear, that his prophets were telling him, go to Ramoth Gilead, you'll be successful. But the hand of God was against them, and it was to lead the king towards his death. Isn't it time maybe listen to some different voices who are telling you something else? But they keep on saying, oh, the scientists say, the economists say, I'm like, everyone is telling you the same thing. Where are the dissenting voices? Oh, you silenced them. And then months later, the dissenting voices were right. But you're still listening to foolish advisors in the first place. That's the kind of stuff that should give you a high index of suspicion that something is wrong. And for some people, it's like you're on the Royal Mail Service Titanic, the Armist Titanic, and you see it going down, but you're clinging on to a sinking ship. The donkey was trying to save Balaam, but Balaam was whipping the donkey. But the angel of the Lord stood in the pathway of the vineyards. So went one way, the angel of the Lord went there to go resist him. A wall being on this side and a wall on that side. When the ass saw the angel of the Lord, the, she thrust herself onto the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And he smote her again. Again, yes, it hurt Balaam. At first, maybe embarrassing, the donkey turning aside. Now the donkey is crushing him. And it seems that the donkey is against Balaam but the donkey was actually for him. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. Again, is God's hand for you, your nation, or against? And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled. And he smote the ass with a staff. So the donkey paying a price of trying to save a man's life. But well, he was continuing folly. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee, that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me. I would there were a sword in mine hand, for now would I kill thee? And some would be saying, Did this donkey speak or not? Yes, it did. And it's interesting. A donkey is speaking. But Balaam isn't like, A donkey speaking. He's just talking back like it's a regular conversation. Like something that happened before. How many people have been labeled as donkeys? As if they're just putting on hot air, but it turns out that they were right. But they were silenced when those voices were near the most. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am I not thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. So the donkey is like, Hey, I've been faithful to you all this time. I've never done anything like this to you. And now that I'm doing this stuff, shouldn't you take note that something's going on while this is happening? Some people are stuck in their folly. And they keep on following the advice of foolish advisors. But even that, the Lord can hand people over to their delusions. He can ensure that they get foolish advice so that they too will go over into a pit. Especially when they don't want to hear because of the story of King Ahab. Micaiah 
was a prophet of the Lord. And King Ahab did not want to hear from him. He wanted to hear from his in-house prophets who would tell him what he wanted to hear. And he didn't want to entertain the dissent. And in fact, in 1 Kings 22, when Micaiah told him the truth, even how the Lord had sent a lying spirit to deceive his prophets, King Ahab had the prophet arrested. Micaiah. Deplatform him, if you will. Try silencing him. But that didn't work. The hand of God was against Ahab, and he died in battle that day. He learned the hard way. Who was speaking on behalf of the Lord versus who was not? Again, God does not change. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me, and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee, and saved her alive. Balaam did not discern the hand of God was against him. And in fact, he could actually say that he was on an assignment from the Lord. He was obeying the Lord's orders. Some can't discern that they are at enmity with God. And they may think that they are on an assignment for God, for good. But the Lord has set them up for their own destruction. But when they recognize the truth, it won't be because an angel stands after the Lord has opened their eyes. It will be because they open their eyes in hell and realize that they were wrong. So back up again. Behold, I went out to withstand thee because Thy way is perverse before me. Perversion, it draws God, it draw draws God's ire. In Isaiah 5, especially like in verse 20, woe unto those who call evil good and good evil. That is perversion. Saying right is wrong and wrong is right. Are there perverse leaders over your country? And the ass saw me, and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee, and saved her alive. And Balaam said unto the angel, I have sinned. For I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now therefore, if it displeased thee, I'll get back again. Where is the hand of God on your nation? Is it for or against? Are people calling good evil and evil good? Are they tolerating or are they celebrating sin? Are they trying to take the nation down to deeper and deeper levels of perversion? Those are some of the things that let the sons of Issachar, they'll help you discern the sign of times or the sign of the times to see what the hand of God is for or against your nation. When things that God hates are not simply tolerated, but they're celebrated, there should be a cause of concern. And you may be someone who loves to pray. And if you heard the Lord say, don't pray, and you're thinking that's the devil telling you don't pray, because which, why would God tell you not to pray? Jeremiah 7, 11, and 14. It does happen. Sometimes judgment comes, and prayer will not help. 
Holy Spirit of the Lord God, guide into all truth. I have said what I need to say in this message. And I pray that if possible, people will repent of the wickedness. Because if not, God will not repent of the evil that he has thought to do to those who have come against him by worshiping other gods. And then he's trying to thrust those God or those nations into idolatry to worship other gods. To include one of the seven things that are an abomination unto the Lord, the shedding of innocent blood. <laughs> For those who want to get drunk on the blood of the innocent, the sword of the Lord will get drunk on your blood. God is merciful until he's not. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the true and living God. <laughs>